This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Using manual SICS as a tool to correct pre-existing astigmatism during cataract surgery. Hi, he is an 85-year-old gentleman with nuclear cataract and pseudo exfoliation and who is posted for cataract surgery. He has a significant amount of against the rule astigmatism. Let me show you the other eye refractive and corneal details and uh, he is pseudo phakic and these are his K readings showing about 4 diopters of against the rule astigmatism. Uh, this eye has undergone manual SICS with a superior incision elsewhere and the superior incision would have added on and worsened the pre-existing agazural astigmatism leading to this high amount of residual cylinder. Now we counsel the patient and his family for a toric intraocular lens in this eye to be operated but he and his family were unwilling for a toric lens as they told us that they can't afford it. So to deal with the situation I am planning a manual SIC surgery with a temporal incision of around 6.5 mm to counter this amount of pre-existing astigmatism. 1 ml of lignocaine is injected in the inferior middle quadrant in the subtenon space. This gives me enough analgesia but limited or no akinesia. The temporal conjunctiva usually will have these degenerations near the limbus which will heap up when we suture back the conjunctival flap later leading to some sort of a delin formation. To address this issue I am going to use a transconjunctival scleral incision. It is placed about 1.5 mm behind the limbus and the globe is stabilized by a modified globe stabilizer. The tunneling is being done under the conjunctiva itself. Uh, there is going to be this issue of conjunctival bleed which is going to hamper the visualization. Constant irrigation and also active aspiration by my assistant using a suction pump helps to keep the field clean and also enhance visualization. A decent size scleroconial tunnel is created. The side ports are made and the anticapsule is stained followed by OVD injection. The main incision is created. I am just currently creating a 2.8 mm incision itself and stopping at that as I am going to perform the pre-chopping of the nucleus through the small incision itself. The rexis is now created and it turns out to be slightly bigger than what I intended to have. Nevertheless, it's alright. Hydrodissection is performed and nuclear mobility is confirmed. Cohesive OVD is placed in the antechamber. My plan is to perform in the bag nucleus by section. So the two familiar instruments are picked, the horizontal blunt chopper or the Chang chopper in my left hand and the Dr. Sohail Khan pre-chopper in my right. The Chang chopper is turned horizontally as it slides under the distal rexus margin and is then turned vertically to hook the endonucleus. Dr. Khan's pre-chopper is held just in the proximal part that is just in front of the rexus margin. Now this is a grade 3 nucleus in an elderly man and hence I expect it to be reasonably dense. So appropriate hooking of the endonucleus at the distal end by the Chang chopper and reasonably deep placement of the pre-chopper is ensured before moving these two instruments towards each other. As the two instruments approach each other, the nucleus cracks into two halves. These two instruments themselves are used to perform lateral separation of the hemineucleus. Time to enlarge the incision. Again the globe is being stabilized and the incision is enlarged using the sharp keratome to about 6.5 mm. Time to remove each of these hemineucleus out of the bag first and then out of the eye. Under the cover of cohesive OVD using two Sinsky hooks, the first hemineucleus is being prolapsed out. The second hemineucleus also tries to come along as the posterior plate is not completely separate. Sinsky hook itself is used to break the fine attachments separating them and eventually only one hemineucleus is prolapsed out of the bag. Under cover of OVD using a vectus and a dialer, it is easily extracted out using the phaco sandwich technique. 
The second heminucleus is then prolapsed out of the bag and then using the same two Sinsky hooks, it is easily extracted out of the eye. Time to aspirate the cortex. By manual, I and A is used to aspirate the cortex. A hydrophobic single piece lens is being placed into the bag. OVD both in front and behind the lens is aspirated out. The side ports are hydrated and that's it, the case is done. I'm just measuring the internal incision length, it's about 6.5 millimeter. Curious to know how much astigmatism is this going to induce. This is how the wound looks at the end of the surgery. I'm just trying to approximate the conjunctival edges towards each other. I'm not using any cautery. And let's see how things are there in the first post-op day. So these are the pictures in the first post-op day. This is the autorefractometer reading and the keratometer reading. The keratometer reading shows there's a reduction of 0.75 diopters of against dual astigmatism. And let us see how things are the 15th day of uh, the surgery. The wound is pretty much healed, the patient is happy with his vision. But when we measure the keratometry, the residual against the astigmatism is still about one diopter. Well, this implies that the amount of surgical induced astigmatism by a 6.5 mm temporal sclerocorneal incision is just about 0.5 diopters. Clearly, this case demonstrates that a well-constructed temporal sclerocorneal tunnel for manual SICS induces very less astigmatism. In my experience, it has been about 0.5 to 0.75 diopters and never above 0.75. So the temporal sclerocorneal tunnel might not be very effective tool to correct high degrees of agazerol astigmatism, but it definitely has a great role to play in most routine cases which ensures that we get a very predictive refractive outcomes with surgical induced astigmatism almost comparable with that of acromalsification. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.